This is a story that began with a bag. A bag that has made three trips across the Atlantic and by the time this film is completed, will have made its final journey. I was first told of the bag by a friend in Long Melford, Suffolk, who knew I did family history, especially military family history. He introduced me to his friend, John Cashmore, who collects militaria particularly the United States Army Air Force, the USAAF, in East Anglia during the Second World War, when Britain and their allies, which included the USA, were at war with Germany. John Cashmore was especially interested in the 486 Bombardment Group, which was based on the airfield at Great Waldingfield Road near Sudbury, one of many such airfields in East Anglia. John had bought the bag off eBay. It was a flight bag, used for uniforms and other clothes. It was not a very glamorous item, but it had a rank and a name, Second Lieutenant Clyde R. Simmons, which was stenciled across the bag, plus his service number. Someone, possibly the seller, had identified Clyde R. Simmons as belonging to the 486 Bomb Group, and it was that which attracted John Cashmore. He placed a bid and won, and became the owner of a somewhat tatty flight bag with a broken zip. The bag also had another name on it, British one, Pilot Officer J. Smith. On either side of the bag's handle were the labels from BOAC, British Overseas Airways Corporation, and the name Mr. J. Smith. These were obviously post-war and British, so it looked as though Pilot Officer J. Smith had continued his flying in a civilian capacity. But it was Clyde R. Simmons who interested John Cashmore. Just as well, for tracing a J. Smith would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible. Following some research, it was discovered that Clyde R. Simmons had been a pilot flying B-17s, flying fortresses, bombers, and he had been killed in a crash on the 26th of April 1945. The plane that had collided with Clyde's plane was another B-17, which was also based in Sudbury, and it had the nickname Miss B. Haven. Get it? So, to find out exactly what happened, I had to obtain the original air accident reports compiled by the USAAF, which were typed and handwritten with lots of forms and diagrams and drawings, maps, statements by eyewitnesses, etc. And these documents have been scanned and photographed many times, so the images are fuzzy and often difficult to make out. But they are available to purchase online. Well, like all service personnel, Clyde Simmons would have had a service record, which would have detailed where he went, when he went, various personal details, promotions, awards, and so on. Unfortunately, Clyde's USAAF service record was amongst those documents destroyed by a fire in the United States National Archives in 1973, along with thousands of other USAAF personnel. However, other documents from other sources can help recreate a record of service, but there will inevitably be gaps. It's like doing a jigsaw that has pieces missing and no picture to refer to. So to begin with, Clyde had a life before he joined the USAF. I found Clyde on the Family History website, Ancestry, which showed he had lived in Joplin, Missouri, and he'd attended high school there. As a teenager, he'd had his photo taken. It was thanks to the 1940 US Census and Googler Street View that I could find the house he had lived in. 717 Pearl Street, Joplin, and quite a modest house by the look of it. Well, Joplin's old newspapers online 
gave results of local school examinations and tests, and Clyde seemed to do pretty well, with his name frequently appearing amongst the prize winners' lists. He was obviously a bright boy. He had enlisted in the US Army Air Force in October 1940. And from various documents, I learned that the R of Clyde's middle name stood for Ray. I also learned that he had a brother, Claude Brian Simmons, named after his father. So such similar names and even similar looking middle initial has created huge confusion over the years, not only for me, but also on official documents, where, as I mentioned, fuzzy information made the R for Ray look like B-E-H-K. As I mentioned, there was a Simmons family tree on Ancestry. And it was via this I was able to contact Andrew Simmons, Clyde's nephew. And it was he who sent me photographs of his uncle. First, as a cadet, then a formal portrait after he'd trained as a pilot and become an officer. Well, there are dozens of websites devoted to the USAAF and its role in Britain and Europe during World War II. I found these particularly to be useful. Other websites focus on places, bomb groups, aircraft, and so on. But to return to England, According to the air accident report, the crash site was at Lutton Marsh in Lincolnshire. And Google Maps came up with a general area, flat fields to the east of Spalding. There were photos of the wreckage in the air accident report, but it was virtually impossible to locate the site precisely. I looked at Google Earth map of the area of Lutton Marsh. And there had been a little marker in the Google Earth maps then that indicated Worth Farms. So I found Worth Farms website and emailed the managing director asking if he knew anything about the crash. He didn't, but he said he'd ask around the older people in the area, which he did. And within an hour, I had an email contact of a farm worker, Martin Puttrill, who knew someone who had witnessed the crash as a boy and knew the exact field. Well, Martin proved to be invaluable and we'll come back to him later. Well, the Imperial War Museum at Duxford near Cambridge has two B-17s, Flying Fortresses. So off I went to see them. One of them was called the Sally B and I had a look inside her. This, of course, was really, really useful as it enabled me to imagine where Clyde would have sat and where his fellow crew members would have been. But back to Clyde. Like all would-be air crew, Clyde had undergone flying training, probably in California, which offered little preparation for the foggy, cloudy, rainy, snowy conditions in Europe. Eventually, Clyde and his flight bag were sent to England in May 1943 to join the 351st Bombardment Group based at Polebrook near Oundel in Northamptonshire. He would have worn these badges on his uniform. Clyde flew 28 bombing missions from here, most with the rank of flight officer, but the last two as a second lieutenant, as stated on the bag. So Clyde and his bag then returned to the USA, where he became an instructor at the Air Force Base in Rapid City, South Dakota. By Christmas 1944, Clyde and his brother Claude were both home on furlough. Well, how do I know that? Well, a local newspaper mentioned that in a short news item on the 1st of January 1945, Clyde was referred to as First Lieutenant, a promotion, which was perhaps when he got rid of his bag. He returned to England a week or two later, in early January 1945. This time he was assigned to the 486 Bombardment Group, so he would have had to sew on new badges. So Clyde came to the airfield known as Station 174 RAF Sudbury 
which was, like many similar airfields, a little America, with a large hospital at Acton Place and recreational and leisure facilities in Great Walding Field and many other amenities. He would undoubtedly have spent some time in Sudbury itself, and perhaps he might have even met your grandparents. This large house in East Street became the American Red Cross Service Club during the war. And Clyde flew his first mission on the 28th of March, 1945, with, of course, a new crew. He flew two more missions. Then on the 26th of April, there was a change of crew. Clyde, normally a pilot, was assigned to be aircraft commander on B-17 448687, which meant he was not actually flying the plane during this training flight of formation flying. With him was pilot of the aircraft, Donald Williamson, and a co-pilot observer, James Olson. The rest of the crew comprised a bombardier, Robert Bradley, radio operator gunner, Robert West, and navigator was Vincent Coletti, the engineer gunner, was John Hill, and tail gunner Edward Geron. Unfortunately, I do not have photos of these men, nor Donald Williamson, the pilot. But like others preparing to take off for the formation practice flight, their B-17 was parked and waiting on Sudbury Airfield. On hard standing number 21, right here where I am just standing on just off the perimeter track not far from the Waldingfield Lavenham Road and it was ready to take its place in the takeoff lineup and head north towards Lincolnshire. At the same time on hard standing number six which is off Tentree Road in Great Waldingfield was a B-17 called Miss B Haven with the pilot William Dobbins. Dobbins and his crew had been together several weeks. Indeed, most of them had known each other in the US before they had come to England in early 1945, as this photo shows. Not all of these men were on Miss B Haven on the 26th of April. Those that were William Dobbins, the pilot, Gerard Viola, the radio operator and gunner, James Gearhart, the co-pilot, Thomas Hartman, who was the engineer and gunner, and finally Harold Bergen, who was the navigator. How do I know who was who on the group photo? Because William Dobbins himself had written on the back of the photo who everybody was. And how did I find this photo? It was right here on my doorstep in Sudbury Heritage Centre photo collection. But back to the airfield on the morning of the 26th of April 1945. This formation practice flight involved flying in a box formation in which some planes were higher or lower than others and some were leading, some were following. It required precision flying with little room for error bit like the Red Arrows, but bigger planes and slower. Well, it wasn't all that slow. The weather was a bit murky, but not too bad. Half an hour after takeoff at 10.57 a.m., at an altitude of 11,700 feet, the formation arrived over South Lincolnshire. Eyewitnesses in the other aircraft in the formation later stated that shortly after a shallow left turn was started, an aircraft collided with Clyde's plane. Its left-hand propellers chewed into the tail section of Clyde's plane from above and cut off the tail section, as in this photo. This isn't Clyde's plane, but this type of accident was not uncommon. This is the field where the plane crashed and was pinpointed for me by local farm worker, Martin Puttrell, who placed a white bag on a stick in the field as an identification marker for me. The air accident report stated, after colliding, both planes peeled up and out of formation. Dobbin's plane returned to Sudbury on three engines. Simmons' plane went out of control immediately spun down through the overcast cloud, leveled off momentarily, 
then crashed into the ground. Simmons, Olson, Williamson, West, Geron and Hill, the latter who jumped too low to know his parachute didn't open fully, were killed and they died in that Lincolnshire field. Bradley and Coletti survived and were able to make statements for the air accident report. The official conclusion was that the cause of the accident was poor formation flying on the part of an inexperienced pilot, resulting in him colliding with another aircraft. Meanwhile, Dobbin's plane, Miss B. Haven, limped back to Sudbury with its nose, front guns, a propeller and an engine badly damaged. They were very lucky to make it back. There was a debriefing about what had happened and details noted for the air accident report. And of course, the families of the men who had been killed would have been notified. On the 9th of May, 1945, the Joplin Globe, Clyde's local newspaper back home, ran a column headed, Lieutenant Clyde Simmons killed in England. The newspaper stated the medals awarded to Clyde. Many of you will have been into the Heritage Centre at the back of the town hall in Jail Lane in Sudbury. There is considerable coverage of the Americans in Sudbury during the war, including a roll of honour with the names in columns of the 207 men who died while flying from Sudbury. The names are in alphabetical order, which curiously, but in a rather touching coincidences, the names of the three pilots on board B-17, Clyde Simmons, James Olson and Donald Williamson, are across three columns, with Clyde between the other two. The names of those killed in Clyde's aircraft are included in the electronic roll of honour at the American Air Museum at Duxford. And this is just one example of Clyde having been given the wrong middle initial, as I explained earlier. The US authorities offered families the option of the bodies of their sons to be repatriated to their hometowns in the USA or to be buried in a military cemetery near to where they had died. Only Clyde Simmons and Edward Geron's families asked that their men be buried in the Cambridge American Cemetery at Maddingley. As you have seen, this project turned out to be a biography of Clyde Simmons, the owner of The Bag. It does inevitably, unavoidably have gaps, but it illustrates the experiences of just one American airman who came to Britain during the Second World War to fight against fascism and German aggression. He was not famous or high ranking or took part in iconic raids. He, like thousands of others, came to Britain, and more specifically to Sudbury, albeit for a short time, but never returned to his home country through misfortune and bad luck. This is very much Clyde's story, but stories such as this can be attributed to thousands of young Americans who came to Britain during those bleak days of war. Some, like Clyde, never returned home. Others survived, yet returned for reunions and visits for decades after the war ended. What happened to Clyde Simmons is the reason we erect and revere memorials, such as the one near St. Gregory's Church in Sudbury. It is a reminder of the sacrifices that a previous generation made so that we could enjoy our lives in peace and in freedom. And I, for one, am deeply grateful to them and I owe them a debt of gratitude. We are here to honor not those of us who lived, but those who didn't make it through the war. Who lived or died was basically a matter of chance. When we flew into a solid carpet of flak over the target, flying straight and level until the bombs were dropped, it was inevitable 
that most planes and some men would be hit. Our planes were tough old birds, so that with a hole in the wing or in the tail structure, or with just one engine hit, we could make it home. Those hit in the fuel tanks, or with their flying controls severed, faced disaster. It was just a matter of chance who lived, who died. We who survived grieved for our lost comrades. They may not have been heroes, but they were martyrs. No one should have to die as they died. No one should have to die in their teens or early twenties, losing the flower of their lives, career, marriage, children. We who served with them and lived are pleased that they are honored in perpetuity in the town that was their second home.